Good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Real Review Live. This is, in fact, our 13th um, broadcast of The Real Review Live, incorporating cellar door to door, which is our facility where you can order the wines that are talked about and tasted online. Um, and I remind you that we don't take a cut of the, of the money that comes from them. It's all just a service to you to buy the wines if you want them. We've heard some of you have actually got a whole lot of, or one or two of the bottles to, uh, to, to sip along with us so that you can uh, follow the discussion online. Um, we would like to point out to you that there are um, a, few, a few events coming up. There's Vino Social, which is Christmas crackers on the 8th of December. And um, we have a, a function in, um, uh, we have a, have a first dinner in Adelaide coming up in two weeks, which will be a lot of fun. Nice to get out of it, New South Wales and across to see our friends in South Australia again. Um, and it'll be our first event in South Australia. So very exciting. Um, as usual, we'll be taking questions. So the format is that I run through the eight wines two at a time. We taste two wines and we have two questions. We taste two more wines, two more questions and so on. Um, so please um, uh, go online and use the prompts to, uh, to ask a question uh, anytime you want, and I will get to the, as many as I can get to. Um, this session is supported by Plum 3, which is this glass that I'm holding in my hand, which is a new uh, line of stemware from Plum, which is Australian designed and made in Europe, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, so it's about summer wines tonight. Summer wines. Summer, well, today was high, high 20s in Sydney, and we can feel that the summer is starting to come along. Everything's in blossom. Uh, hay fever's gone mad, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and thoughts turn to what sort of wine that you're going to be wanting to drink over the warmer months. White wines, obviously, chillable white wines and sparkling wines will be top of the list. But also lighter bodied reds, rosés, light reds could be Pinot Noir, they could be um, Pinot Meunier, they could be Gamay, they could be all sorts of varieties that we've seen now coming through in lighter bodied reds. Um, we'll have a, a Pinot at the end of the night, but we're starting off with two sparklings and they're two quite different contrasting sparkling wines, both from um, cool climates, of course. Um, what you want in a refreshing summer wine is something that's light in alcohol, is refreshing, has good cleaning acidity, so that you get that nice cleansing aftertaste, refreshment, not something that weighs you down and is heavy. But you also want something that goes with the food that you're most likely to be eating in the, in the warmer months. And thoughts turn to, to seafood and fish and lighter dishes, vegetable dishes, perhaps. Um, not your hearty stews and braises, perhaps. And probably not your big, full-bodied, 15% alcohol, body thumper, uh, Shirazes and, and Cabernets. Although there's a place for them. But uh, frankly, I don't often feel like drinking wine like that in the hotter months. Not unless I'm in a very conditioned room with nicely acclimatised wines. Um, but these are the sort of wines we're going to be having. Two sparkling, a Vermentino, a Riesling, a Pinot Gris, a Semillon Semillon Blanc, an aged kind of Semillon and a Pinot to begin with, Pinot Noir. So we'll get straight into it. And the first wine we're having is the Ninth Island. Tasmanian um, sparkling rosé. Wow, look at that lovely creamy froth. Lovely mousse it's got and uh, very vibrant, fresh, vigorous little wine. When that moth mousse settles down, you'll be able to see that it's got a beautiful um, coral pink to light salmon pink colour, which is what you'd hope for in a, um, in a young Rosé style. It's made from Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, the three champagne varieties. And it's probably only had about a year on lees, I would suspect. It's a non-vintage, so we don't exactly know, but usually non-vintages have fairly short time on lees in Australia. Um, and that's because this wine is made to a price. It's a $25 wine and a hell of a good value wine. But um, it's also made to a style, fresh, fruity, drink it young, don't worry, it's not a wine for sitting and analysing too much, but it's a wine for really just whipping into you and enjoying it. And it's a great, uh, a great aperitif style wine. Um, this is from Ninth Island, which is the second label of, um, of Piper's Brook Vineyard, which is one of the senior wineries in Tasmania, one of the great wineries in Tasmania, established in 1974, um, very much at the forefront of the rebirth of Tasmanian wine. 
you have to go back to the 50s to um, um, and earlier to when uh, to when the Tassie was really making its first impact as a sparkling area. But um, Andrew Pirri and others like him in the 70s uh, started establishing the new Tassie wine industry. He doesn't own it anymore. It's owned by a Belgian family called the Kreglingers, who've lived in Australia for quite a long time. Uh, they also have a winery in the in the Mount Benson area down on the Limestone Coast near Coonawarra called, um, ah, yes, what's it called? It'll come to me in a moment. <laughs> Mount Benson, Norfolk Rise is the name of the winery. Um, so they are quite committed to the Australian wine industry. Their brands at Piper's Brook, of course, the Piper's Brook brand still exists, but they have Ninth Island as their entry level brand. And above that is Kreglinger, which is their actual name. So there are several brand names involved. Um, Piper's Brook is up in the northeast, um, east of Launceston. They have a lot of vineyards in the, in the Tamar Valley as well. And this is probably where most of this wine comes from, I would think. Winemaker at, uh, at, um, who is consulting to um, Piper's Brook is Natalie Fry. And Natalie is very well known down in Tassie because she was the, the public face of Jantz for many years. Jantz is the Tasmanian sparkling wine arm of Yolumba, of course, and she uh, really perfected those wines. She retired a couple of years ago, started her own business. Her brand is called Belle Bon, and there's some beautiful wines there. But uh, she also consults to, to Piper's Brook, and she has had quite an impact in, uh, on their sparkling wines. So this wine is um, quite a, a fresh, uh, fruity wine, strawberry, raspberry, um, really fresh, attractive characters, fruit driven. Fruit is the main aspect of it, but it's not just simple summer fruits. It's got a bit of extra patina to it, which is conferred by the aging on leaves. And it's a lovely wine. The sweetness is well judged. A lot, a lot of times when you find wines up to about $25, they're a little bit sweet. This wine is not, it's got a lovely clean finish, but it's not austere either. It's, it's beautifully balanced. Um, we scored at um, 95, so it got a, it actually got a gold medal at the Tasmanian Wine Show earlier this year, which is a pretty big achievement for a wine of its price. It did score that in the non-vintage non class, of course, which is probably a slight advantage. It was number two out of 22 sparkling um, blends, sparkling Chardonnay-based blends from Tasmania that we tasted, and it gets a top value rating because of that. Because it's a non-vintage wine, we're just saying don't keep it, drink it now, drink it as early as possible. So there's no cellaring recommendation on it. Um, and finally, we asked the winemaker, uh, Natalie Fryer, the consultant winemaker and the chief winemaker at Piper's Brook, whose name is Luke Whittle, what they would recommend to serve with this. And they've been very regional, very local, and they've suggested Tasmanian native oysters, the Angazi oyster, um, from the Oyster Province. I think that must be the name of a company. Um, and if you squeezed a bit of lemon juice on that, it would, and a bit of bread and butter would make um, an excellent uh, match. But um, I really should just taste the wine on the palate and refresh my memory of this wine. It's again, pretty much as you'd expect from the nose. It's light body, it's refreshing, it's crisp, it's clean, it's not too complicated, but it's lively and it has that refreshment quality that you look for in a young sparkling wine. Um, not complex, complexity is not what they're aiming at. They're just aiming at good flavor, lovely balance, good drinkability, excellent. Okay, we move on to the second wine, which is another sparkling, but a sparkling in a different category, this one. This is a, a more expensive wine. It's um, 50, at least $50. I have two prices for this wine. I'm not quite sure if one is 59 and the other is 50, but um, I think if you buy it from the winery, you can get it for $50. It's the Chandon, Chandon uh, Cuvée 205 from the Upper Yarra Valley. And it's their 2015 vintage. So this is uh, a different creature. This is an older wine, obviously. It's at least five, five and a half years on leaves. And you get a much more complex, much more multifaceted wine when you 
age it on leaves for as long as that. But the quality of the fruit and the quality of the base wine has to be superior to begin with. You can't just age any old sparkling wine on its leaves for five years and expect magic to happen. It doesn't. It's got to be high quality fruit. So this is low yielding, late ripening, cool climate, high altitude Yarra Valley grapes. Um, and it's um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and um, a little bit about the main Chandon. Of course, the main Chandon is very well known to all Australian drinkers of sparkling because it's one of our most visible sparkling brands. They have their winery in the Yarra Valley. It's a destination winery. It's got a restaurant and a wonderful tasting room. It's a great place to visit right beside the Maroondah Highway. Um, it's, a, it's a special place. They do a big range of wines. They do a lot of uh, inexpensive um, drink now, um, non-vintage wine but this is at the high end of what they produce. Um, I mentioned where the grapes are grown. The name of the wine is Cuvée 205, which is an interesting name because it refers to the fact that in Champagne, the traditional style of barrel was a 205 litre barrel. And there's a reason for that because the Champagne press, the traditional Champagne press in which they press the grapes holds four tonnes or 4,000 kilograms of grapes at a time. And when you squeeze that, you're allowed by law to take the first 2,050 litres of juice, and that's called the Premier Cuvée. And that 2,050 litres of juice would fill exactly 10 of these barrels. So that's how the size of the barrel came about. Not many of them use these barrels anymore in Champagne, but Krug obviously still do, and some of the top houses for their top Cuvées are going back to some of these barrels. Um, Domaine Chandon, of course, is owned by um, uh, LVMH, which also owns Moet de Chandon and Dom Perignon. So they have access to all of the good stuff that they have in Champagne. So an unusual vineyard, this one, it's on granite soil, which is unusual for the Yarra Valley. And uh, the winemaker, Dan Buckle, thinks that's something a little bit different and a little bit special about this, this vineyard. And it grows low yields of very concentrated grapes with concentrated flavors. And they are particularly age worthy, especially in years like 2015, which was a cooler year very high natural acidity in the grapes, just ideal for long aging. So let's have a taste. The wine has got a light straw color, which is, you know, if it was pure Chardonnay, it would be much more white colored than that, but the Pinot gives it a very, very slight tinge. And when you sniff it, wow, it's a totally different creature to the first one. It's all about complexity, nutty, spicy, yeasty, freshly baked bread, all of that sort of thing, a bit of dry biscuit, savoury biscuit, lemon and honey as well. Um, and the oak barrel influence, there's not, a, not an influence of oak as, as a smell of oak, it's the, more the influence of maturation in the barrel which gives you a slight oxidation effect and which transmutes the flavours of the fruit into something more interesting. So, wow, that's a great bouquet. I could sit and sniff that for a long time, but I'm not going to, I'm going to taste some. Mm. That is a great wine. That is a fantastic wine. Fills the mouth with flavor, beautiful texture, creamy, creamy texture, balance, intensity. It's not big or heavy, but it's just, it's got the combination of finesse and intensity, which is a winning thing. On the flavour spectrum, it's got a great combination of complexity from age as well as fruit character. And to me, when you get all of those things in nice balance, you end up with a great sparkling wine or for the potential for a great sparkling wine. The length of flavour of that wine is amazing. So I think for if you could buy it for $50, that's a, that's, that's a gift, frankly. Um, a lot of people would charge a lot more for a wine like that. So what did we score it? We scored it 96 out of 100, which is a very high gold ribbon score. It scored the third out of 34 uh, Pinot Noir sparkling blends uh, from across the country in 2015 vintage. And that gives it a top rank rating according to the real review system. So um, we recommend drinking it now and for another five or six years. Um, I think it's at its peak now but it should hold quite well for several more years. It's an aging, a wine that's aging reasonably slowly and gracefully, and I wouldn't be in any hurry to drink it, but um, neither would I want to wait until it's too old. It's just so good now. We asked the winemaker, Dan Buckle, 
what his food match would be, and he says chicken with kumquat, a chicken and kumquat tagine. In other words, a Moroccan casserole involving fruit and chicken, which is, I think, a fascinating idea. Um, full marks for originality, Dan, and um, I would really like to try that. I think it, it could go well. It has the complexity and the body weight to, to cope with that sort of dish. The second choice that he's given us is fromage d'affinois, which is, of course, a creamy, washed, uh, creamy white mould French cheese, freely available in Australia. And he's gone one further and suggested you put it on caraway and rye sourdough bread. Sounds great. Could not wait to try that, Dan. I really want to give that a go. So well done. Um, what a great start that is. Um, two beautiful bubblies and exactly the sort of thing you'll be wanting um, over this summer. We're going to have some questions now, a couple of quick questions. And, and uh, Oscar says, how many different vintages are generally involved in a non-vintage wine? Um, that's uh, how long is a piece of string kind of question because there's no answer to that. Um, if you go to Krug in Champagne, I think they say there are over 100 different um, batches in any, any, in any blend of, uh, of their Krug Grand Cuvée, which is their non-vintage wine. Um, and there are you know, many examples of of, uh, of wineries that use large numbers of vintages and large numbers of batches that they have uh, blended together. But there are also those who only use one vintage and they still call it a non-vintage. Why is that? Well, go figure. I think um, there is a market for non-vintage wine. So if there's a market for it, you might as well cater for it, even if you've only got young wines and have got no older vintage wines to blend in. So. A lot of these Tasmanian young wines are actually single vintage wines. It's come to my attention, but they prefer to call them non-vintage because they want you to, to, to treat the wine as the same wine year after year after year. And they blend it, they try to blend it to a similar flavour and a taste year after year uh, because they see commercial advantages in that, I think. So Poppy says, you are drinking the sparklings out of a glass, not a flute. Why? That's a very good question. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, flutes have gone out of fashion in the sparkling wine world and in Champagne. Uh, they, were, they had their moment in the sun, but I think um, the general belief is now a flute doesn't give you the right amount of bouquet. It only gives you a small opening to sniff out of. And well, they fall over rather easily too. Um, the main reason that people used to give for a flute was that it gave you a long distance so you could enjoy the, watching the bubbles as they floated up from the bottom of the glass. Well, frankly, I don't think that's a very good reason for using a flute. Um, the tulip is probably the preferred glass in champagne these days, although more and more top-end winemakers are putting their top-end wines in something that looks more like a, a Bordeaux glass, a big bowl glass with a big opening, because the more the, the more powerful, the more rich, the more high quality the, the champagne, the more volume of glass you can give it to expand its aroma in. And people are finding that's a much better result. This is, I think, a good, a good glass for sparkling wine generally. It's got quite a big bowl, much bigger than a... Uh, the opening is much wider than, than a flute. Um, it's a bit similar in its capacity and somewhat similar in shape to a tulip, but it has this square-shouldered look, which is kind of fashionable at the moment. We'll be using the other plum glass later and that's that's got really square shoulders. So that, that look is very much in vogue at the moment. Okay, thank you for those questions. And moving on to wine number three, um, we have, we're gonna have a Vermentino, which is something quite new and quite different, um, reasonably new. It's one of the alternative varieties that we're seeing more and more across Australia now. And um, it's a, a variety that's come to us from, from Italy. Uh, it's very famous in Italy, in uh, the warmer south, southern to central parts of Italy, such as um, uh, Liguria, uh, Campania, um, and the islands of Sardinia and Sicily, where they grow a lot of Vermentino there. And it's a nice, light, refreshing, summery wine not too complicated, not usually rich or heavy or barrel fermented in any way. It's just a pure fruit wine normally um, and uh, has a lot, of, a lot of good qualities 
which, uh, which fit in with summery type foods, I think. Now this comes from Oliver's Taranga Vineyards, which is one of the older properties in McLaren Vale. The Oliver's family have been there for 179 years, according to their website current as of today. And six generations have farmed land there. They have quite a big vineyard and they grow grapes, not just for themselves, but for lots of other wineries, including Penfolds. And they're in, they are members of the Penfolds Grange Growers Club, which means that they have had grapes that have gone into Penfolds Grange. So a pretty, a pretty uh, special vineyard, you have to say. In charge of the vineyard is the patriarch, Don Oliver, and his daughter, Corinna, Corinna Wright is her married name, she is the winemaker and she's also the manager of the company. She's a bit of a mover and shaker, Corinna. She's involved in many areas of the wine industry, not just making her own wine. She judges in wine shows and she's been involved in industry organisations. Um, and, uh, and as I've said, she's quite a pioneer when it comes to alternative grape varieties. Apart from the Vermentino, they're also growing Fiano, Tempranillo, Sagrantino and Menthia. And I think it's just about the only Menthea I can think of right now in Australia. So I'm pretty sure they were the first was Menthea. Um, so if you're interested in investigating those alternative red varieties from Italy, that's one place to look. McLaren Vale has become very, very, I think, um, much a leader in, in, in not just the white varieties of Italy, but the reds as well. So let's have a taste of this wine. Very pale colour. You can see that it's a 2020 vineyards. A 2020 vintage. Um, so you would expect the colour to be as pale as that. It's almost as clear and white as water. Um, it will get darker as it ages, but it's not going to get much time to age, not this bottle anyway. Um, it's a wine that I'd recommend for drinking young and when it's fresh and fruity. The aroma is clean, fresh, and has tropical touches to it. Mango, guava, a touch of lemon, citrus, um, there's a little bit of minerally kind of oyster shell character there, which I find often find in wines that are grown near the sea. This is a peculiar thing. And some people say that it's the sea breeze that brings that, that um, sea kind of smell onto the grapes. You find it in Margaret River quite a lot as well. Um, and this vineyard is, is quite close to the sea. So that flinty, flinty thing is there on the nose and makes it just a little more interesting than just simple fruit. Let's taste it. Light bodied, crisp acidity, but balanced, um, clean, dry finish, very appetizing, very refreshing. It's a wine you want to have another sip of. It's got refreshing qualities. And I would think that would go with a huge range of food types, especially fish, fish and seafood, but vegetable dishes as well, salads. It's a good tension there between the sweeter and savoury elements in the wine. I don't mean to say that it's sweet. There is no detectable residual sugar in the wine, but there is that fruit sweetness which you get in, in good ripe grapes and there are the savoury elements which are that sort of minerally thing that I was talking about. And it finishes clean and dry with just a touch of phenolic, touch a little, little bit of group, uh, tannin group there just to clean it off and to give it that extra backbone to go with food. 2020 vintage, just a baby, but already drinking well. We suggest you drink it now, but between now and six or seven years hence. Uh, we scored at 93 out of 100, which is a very strong silver ribbon score. Uh, $25 wine, it's exactly what you would hope the price would be for wine like that. We asked Corinna Wright what food she would like to serve it with, and she said, straight and simple, kingfish sashimi. So I frankly think that if you went to any good Japanese restaurant and ordered a platter of mixed sashimi, um, this wine would go really well with, with, with all types of sashimi. Sushi as well, for that matter. So very, very interesting wine and a, an alternative to, to, the, um, to the varieties that you might normally think of when you're thinking of light-bodied summery white wines. Okay, moving on to something that's a little more recognised to most of you is Riesling. And this Riesling comes from the Eden Valley. It's Gibson, Gibson, uh, Eden Valley Riesling 2019. So it's not, 
that's not 2020, which I heartily approve of. I think there are far too many reasons on the market, too young. Um, this wine's now nearly 18, more than 18 months old. Um, it is produced by a chap called Rob Gibson, who um, uh, Rob Gibson has been around the Barossa all of his life. He is a former vineyard manager for South Corp. That's going back a few years now to when South Corp existed, but South Corp owned Penfolds at the time. And Rob's job was to be vineyard manager for all of the Penfolds vineyards in South Australia. Quite a big job. Um, so he's first and foremost a viticulturist. He calls himself the dirt man. He's very proud of the fact that he's a dirt man and he's very, um, you know, he's very down to earth the way that he speaks about wine as well. I really like that uh, in, a, in a wine producer. He, um, he gets help to make his wines, I'm sure, but he's probably a pretty good winemaker himself now. He's had to be. He's uh, transformed himself from just a vineyard guy to a winemaker as well. But to make this wine, he enlists the support of a very, very competent, qualified, experienced winemaker of white wines called Andrew Wigan. And those people who've tried Peter Lehman wines would know that Peter Lehman's top semion is called, top Riesling, I'm sorry, is called the Wigan Reserve. And it's named after Andrew Foot Wigan, even though he's retired now and doesn't work there anymore. He worked for Peter Lehman all of his working life, pretty much, as far as I'm aware. Andrew started at Saltrams with him. Um, and he and Rob Gibson have been great mates all their lives. Uh, I think they even live, live next door to each other or something. But uh, Rob said, said to, uh, to, to um, Wigo, I want you to help me make a good Riesling, much the same style as you made at Lehman. So pick the grapes early, make it crisp and dry and very, very age worthy. And that's exactly what they've ended up with in this wine. Just about everybody in the Brossa who makes Riesling sources their grapes from the Eden Valley because the Barossa floor is a bit too low in altitude and a bit too hot for delicate white varieties. So up in the Eden Valley, 450 metres, you know, the Barossa floor is, you know, about an average of about 100 metres. But so that's about 350 metres higher than the Barossa floor. And that means quite a difference in temperature, quite a difference in humidity. The soils are different. Everything suits Riesling really, really well up there. And of course, the great Pusey Vale Vineyard was established in 1847. So they've been growing Riesling there for a very long time. Um, so that's a bit about Gibson and Andrew Wigan who helps him make this wine. Um, there's not much about grapes and vineyards that Rob Gibson doesn't know in the, uh, in the Barossa Valley. The way they get this style of delicate wine, and it's only 10.9% alcohol, is by picking the grapes fairly early. So that the potential alcohol, in other words, the sugar in the grapes is still quite low. The natural acidity is high and the delicacy, the finesse of the wine is really, really exactly what they want. Let's have a taste. It's not as pale as the previous wine. It's got a, a light yellow straw color because it's a bit older. It's starting to build some color. And when I sniff it, wow, that is already starting to develop some of the lovely toasty characters that you get in mature or semi-mature Eden Valley Riesling. There are dried herbs and dried flowers. To me, dried floral notes are really one of the signatures of Eden Valley Riesling. Beautiful. I could sit and sniff that for a long time. It's got a gorgeous nose. And I think that's come along a long way since I first tasted this one. And it was quite tight and quite youthful. Um, let's have a taste. Mm. Oh, beautiful wine. Gosh, I really want to sit down and drink that now. Um, I might do that later. Um, it's not bone dry. There is just a tickle of sweetness there, which I think takes the edge off the acidity and, and counts against austerity. So there's no... No sign of austerity there, even though it's a very low alcohol, quite high acid uh, wine that's made to age. That is just, a, they really nailed the style beautifully there. Uh, vibrant, fresh, tingly, age worthy, drinking beautifully now, but will go on for a long time. We've said drink it until 2030. That's 10 years, no problem. We scored at 95, which is a gold ribbon score. It got the top rank, a top rank rating, number two out of 46 2019 Rieslings from the Eden Valley that we've tasted. $35 a bottle. 
Really, really good value wine. Riesling is so underrated, so underrated. Um, what have we said here about food? Rob Gibson has suggested a prawn and crispy rice noodle salad. Very simple. Presumably you'd cook the prawns first and toss them into your salad and Bob's your uncle. That would be really good fun. I would think that would be the perfect thing. Although just about anything that swims uh, would go with, uh, with a wine like this, fish of seafoods of all, all types. Terrific stuff. That's my sort of wine. Now the next uh, wine, we'll have a couple of questions before that. Um, if we can find some questions. Um, one, Joe says, what other grape varieties, white grape varieties taste most similar to Vermentino? Ah, well, the thing about these varieties, these alternative varieties, is that they all have a particular personality of their own, which is the reason why winemakers take them up. Because if they just tasted like another variety, they wouldn't be that interesting. I think some of the other Italian, Southern Italian varieties, I think have some commonality with Vermentino. Fiano, I often have trouble telling Fiano apart from Vermentino, but it depends how the wine is made. You know, there are some, some really quite eccentric ways of making wine in Italy. <laughs> I'm thinking of wines like Vernaccia di San Gimignano, which can be pretty strange, and Frascati, which can be pretty strange to my palate. Um, it really depends on who's made the wine. Um, modern Australian winemaking captures the essence of the grape. That's what most people here try to do. So, you know, when you're tasting a wine like the Olivers, you're tasting the grape as it should be tasted. There's no artifact in there. There's no faultiness in there. There's no marginal oxidation, which you get in a lot of Italian white wines. Um, and um, so, you know, my answer would be to buy a bottle of Vermentino and a bottle of Fiano or anything else you want to compare it with and just line them up and taste them together because you know, the best way to learn about these things is to taste and taste and compare things. Um, but I'll pass on that, that question, Joe, I'm sorry to say. Um, Oscar says, how was the 19 vintage in Eden Valley? Um, the 19, I can't tell you in great detail, except that it was a successful vintage. I think it was probably not as great a vintage for red wines. 18 was a great vintage for red wines. 19 was good. Um, but white wines often have a slightly different experience of the year. And um, I think this is, a, it, it, you know, they've had a lot of warm years in the, in the, in the Barossa. Um, 17 was the last time they had a cooler than usual vintage. Um, and I suspect this is having a bit of an impact on how the wines develop. This Gibson wine is developing a little more toastiness a little more quickly than I might expect it to. So I have a suspicion that that wine is not going to age as slowly as maybe a classic Eden Valley reason. Still think 10 years is, it, it will do 10 years without any problems at all. So maybe in the distant future, they'll be looking for somewhere cooler to grow their grapes. Um, moving on to uh, the Bangor Jimmy's Hill, we're on to uh, Pinot Gris now. Now this is a, a really, a, a producer that very few people on the mainland would probably have heard of, Bangor, which is interesting because a very old property in Tasmania. Um, it's on the east coast of Tasmania and down the east coast you find a lot of wine properties now or a lot of properties that are very old that have been in the same family's hands since the 19th century which were grazing properties. And in, when wine became fashionable, they put in a few acres of grapes. And there's a lot of them down the West Coast, the East Coast. And um, these people have a large property of about a thousand acres, I think, and there are only about four acres of, of grape vines. Um, but wow, it's a really, really significant vineyard. Um, so if you drive from Hobart towards Port Arthur, and the, um, the Tasman Peninsula, you would probably go pretty close to this vineyard. It's not far from Brim Creek, which is another vineyard in the same area, and very uh, highly, um, uh, uh, strongly remembered bushfire happened there back in 2013. A terrible bushfire at a place called Dun Alley, which is right next to this vineyard, Bangor Vineyard. And these people, the Dun Dunbabin family, were fighting that fire for three weeks, would you believe? They lost buildings, they lost fencing, but happily they didn't lose the vineyard. Um, 
And I can remember seeing those pictures of people huddling under a jetty in the water trying to escape from the smoke and the fire. And that fire came through. Um, Tassie is a cool climate, but it is no stranger to dry seasons and bushfires. The Dunbabin family have been making wine or sort of farming there, not making wine, but making uh, growing uh, sheep, I think, mainly since the 1890s. So there are three, fam three generations of that family who are working side by side there today. Um, their wines are not made by them. They're made by the biggest contract winemaker in Tassie, which is called Tas Vintners, formerly known as Winemaking Tasmania, who do a very, very good job. And a, a testament to how good a job they do is that they won several trophies at the last Tasmanian wine show, including for sparkling wine and for their Pinot Noir. But this wine also did very well. Let's have a taste. It's the Bangor Jimmy's Hill Pinot Gris 2018. There are two Jimmy's Hill Pinot Gris. There is a reserve, which is barrel fermented, um, a different style of wine, more complex wine, um, a little more expensive. This one is Pinot Gris straight down the line, um, just the fruit, no artifact. And quite an interesting and different nose. It's a lot of dry straw, spicy, um, a minerally beach sand kind of character, a bit like what we were talking about with the Vermentino. Um, interesting, it's, just, it's not just simple fruit. There is an element of, of lychee, which is the a character you often get in Pinot Gris when the grapes are really nice and ripe. It can often be as spicy as Gewürztraminer sometimes, a really ripe Pinot Gris, but this one hasn't gone quite that far. But a really nice nose, a really good um, mixture of primary fruit and other characters which might have come through maturation or from the soil, the site itself. It's a two year old wine, two and a half years old. So it's had some time to build a little extra bottle developed character as we call it. Really quite an interesting nose. Mm. And the wine has a lot of richness. It's, um, it's not a big wine, but it has richness and it has breadth of flavour in the mouth. It has depth. It has plenty of flavour, character and charm. Clean, dry finish, the long follow through. Really nice wine, $29 a bottle, so it's not expensive. Uh, we rated that number one, we rated it 95 points, which is a gold ribbon. And we rated it number one or ranked it number one out of 26 Pinot Gris from Tasmania in 2018. So there were a lot of a lot of Pinot Gris coming out of Tassie now. We said drink it now until 2023. I don't think this wine needs age. I don't think age will do much to it. It'll hang on for quite a while, but uh, to get the best out of it, probably next the next three years. Um, the food match. We did ask the winemakers at Tas Vintners what, uh, what food they would put with this. And they said, I don't know who wrote this, but it's very personal. He or she said, I drink our Pinot Gris with fresh flathead, we catch at home, tossed in panko crumbs with salt and pepper, then shallow fried in vegetable oil with a bit of butter. Actually, I suspect that might have been one of the Dunbabins who wrote that because their vineyard is right on the water. They have a water frontage and they can probably just go down to the bottom of the garden, throw the line in the water and pull out a flathead if they feel hungry, which would be a great place to be. So I really like that wine. I think it's a beauty. It's got a, a real point of difference. That question before about how do these wines taste different? The best thing is just to line a few bottles up and just taste them because you really, that throws them into stark relief. Okay, number six wine is Cullen from Margaret River, a very famous producer from Margaret River. This one needs very little introduction. Um, Cullen, of course, is one of the earliest wineries in Margaret River. It's a benchmark producer. They, um, they are a model winery. They do everything so well. Such a model winery. In fact, I'll just blow our trumpet for a minute. Um, we have a thing called the Real Review Top Wineries of Australia list, which we publish early every year. And Cullen's came in number one this year. So they were the top of the list. Um, they make great wine across the board, but the other thing that makes them interesting is they, their philosophies. They do things very much their own way. They're all biodynamic. All of their vineyards are biodynamically managed and have been for some years, and all of their grapes come from their own vineyards. 
um, they do the full bit. They're not just throwing on the, uh, the biodynamic preparations as sprays on their vineyard. They do everything like harvesting according to the lunar phases and everything like that, which is very important to winemaker Vanya Cullen. Um, other people discuss at great length whether it's the biodynamic philosophies that make their wines so good. I tend to think that they just try harder than other people. Um, whether or not it's biodynamics, I'm not sure. I'm sure Vanya would say absolutely biodynamics has improved the quality of their fruit. Um, I do know that they're now getting ripeness in a lot of their wines, especially Cabernet, at an earlier sugar level than they used to. So they can make really intense, beautifully flavoured Cabernet and Cabernet Merlot blends with moderate alcohols when, you know, 13 and a half percent when other people are using 14 and a half. So to me, that's a, if that's the, one of the corollaries of being biodynamic, it's a very good outcome. So they're very, very biodynamic. And, and now a lot of their wines are named with slightly hippy dippy names like Dancing in the Sun, this is called. Cullen Wines Dancing in the Sun White, because I think there's a red as well. And this is the 2018, so they've held it back for a while. It's not a new wine. It's, well, it is a new wine on the market, but it's two and a half years old, which is great. like to see that. It's a Semillon Sauvignon Blanc with a little bit of Vidello in it. Now, everybody in Margaret River makes a Semillon Sauvignon Blanc, just about everybody, but not many of them taste like this. This is a really individual style. And a lot of their wines, a lot of the region's wines are grassy and herbaceous and very aromatic, pungent. Um, I'm not a big fan of that style. I much prefer something like this, which downplays those herbal characters, which has got, I think, a, a combination. It's a combination of factors, ripe grapes, low yielding vineyards, good canopy management, and then fermenting the wine in old barrels. And all of those things contribute towards a wine which is not as grassy and green and more, um, more complex to smell and taste. So when I sniff that, I smell savoury elements. I smell nutty aromas, uh, savoury, earthy aromas, a bit of oak perhaps, cedar, dried herbs, not green herbs, but dried herbs. Um, a really, really interesting wine. And um, it's a wine that I want to drink. It's not a wine that says, oh, gosh, that smells like lawn clippings. I don't want to drink that. It's a wine with character. Let's have a, have a taste. Hmm. Yep. And just as you expect, it's got a much fuller, richer uh, palette shape than most of these Semillon Sauvignon Blanc wines. Um, really, really generous mouthful of flavour, but it's not big and heavy and clumsy. It's got lightness of being, it's got freshness and finesse, and it's got a nice clean finish that makes you want to have more. A really, really good wine. I scored it, um, we scored it 92 out of 100. So it's a good, strong silver ribbon score. We said drink it now until 2030. In fact, I've had wines, not, not this particular Dancing in the Sun, but what it used to be called, which was just Cullen Wines Sauvignon Blanc Semillon. I've had them uh, more than 12 years old and they've been beautiful. I think they age beautifully. It depends what you want. If you like that sort of wine, drink it young. If you like to age them and see those extra complexities, then keep them a bit longer. It was rated number four out of 15 of the Semso blends of the 18 vintage from Margaret River, so very highly ranked, and it's a top value ranking according to the Real Review system. $25 a bottle, I think that is a very, very well-priced wine. Vanya Cullen, the winemaker, has said for the food match, pan-fried scallops with biodynamic garden herbs. They grow their own herbs, of course, uh, and vegetables for their restaurant at the winery and everything's biodynamic. Second choice would be crumbed whiting with biodynamic garden salad. So everything's biodynamic except the fish, but fish are always biodynamic, aren't they? Anyway, scallops, um, doesn't, I don't know where the scallops come from, but I think that would be a terrific, either of those would be really good with this wine, no problem. Okay, moving along to wine number, no, we're not, we're gonna take a question or two if we have any online. And Matt Dunbabin, goodness. Hello, Matt. Uh, the maker of the Bangor wine or the grower of the grapes. Anyway, Pinot Gris is very popular at the moment. Just a fad or will it continue for a while? I can't see it falling over anytime soon, Matt. I think um, I think it's going to be with us for quite a while. Um, yeah, I, I think that um, 
you know, New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc, everybody looks across the Tasman and they're saying that that's probably reached its uh, the top of its apex and might be coming down the other side a little bit. But I don't think Pinot Gris is going to be suffering from that movie star kind of syndrome that Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc has. I think it's just a, a quiet achiever. It's been growing steadily and gently over many years. And there's a real, a real liking for it, a real market for it out there. Um, I can't see that it's going to be a fly nighter at all. Um, Joe says, how can one smell savoury elements? Isn't that a taste? Um, the way I use the word savoury, it's the opposite of fruity. It's pretty much a simple, a simple way of describing it. There are many aromas, smells in wine, which are not identified as primary fruit aromas. And to me, those give you the savoury characters and they can come from age, bottle age. They can come from barrel maturation. They can come from the lees. If you mature the wine with its lees before bottling it, there are many ways that savoury elements come into a wine. Taste, and, and uh, Joe says, is that a t isn't, it sa isn't it true to say savoury is something you taste, not, the, not what you smell? I think it's what you taste and smell. Um, yeah, um, we all fortunately have our own languages, but that's me describing the way I use the word savoury. I think savoury wines are more complex than simple fruity wines. That's a pretty important point to make. Okay, moving on to the next wine, which is Semillon. We're uh, back in a very recognisable country here with a, a medium, semi-mature Hunter Valley Semillon, classic style, a classic Australian style, wonderful stuff. One of my favourite drinking wines and one of my favourite food wines. And if while I was thinking of what wines that I plan to be drinking more of this summer, in going back to the summer drinking theme of this webcast, I think Semion of this style, five years old, with a bit of age on it, not too young, but some of the very young ones are also beautiful. Uh, that'd be high on my list. So this wine is from um, the Margan family. The Margan family are, um, they've been in the, in, the, in the Hunter for a while. Andrew Margan is the current winemaker and owner with his wife, Lisa. And uh, Andrew's father, Frank, was a, a local personage of some uh, note. He was a restaurateur in Cessnock. He wrote books and articles about wine. He was a great wine man. And um, Andrew got the bug from him, no doubt. And Andrew started his career at Tyrrell's where he learnt at the feet of the master, Murray Tyrrell himself. So he learned all about how to make great Hunter Valley Semillon when he was working at Tyrrell's. And then in 1996, he and Lisa went off to the Broke Fordwich region, which is a little sub-region of the Hunter Valley out to one side, which has got a slightly different climate, slightly different terroir from the Picolban, the central Picolban area. Uh, but uh, Andrew very much believes in this area. He's staked his future in this area. They have vineyards that they own. They only make wine from their own vineyards and they're all in Broke Fordwich. So um, when he began making Semillon, I thought, I thought that he made, was making a fruitier style with not quite as dry on the finish, a more accessible wine that for people to get to know his wines before they uh, you know, treated them like a Tyrrells or something where you put it away for 10 years. They were wines to drink young. Now, in recent years, he's been branching out and making some wines that are more age-worthy. They're not his biggest selling wines. They're the cream at the top of the pyramid. But he, one of those wines uh, is this aged release Semillon, five years old when he releases it. It's the 15 vintage. It's called Margan Aged Release Semillon. 2015, it's $50 a bottle, which I think is perfectly reasonable for a wine that's been cellared for that long. And when you taste it, you'll find that it's a wine that's starting to show all those lovely characters of that the Semillon in the Hunter acquires with a bit of time in the bottle, but it's still very young. Light yellow colour, you might expect, um, you know, if it was a Chardonnay, it'd probably be much deeper colour than that, but it's not. It hasn't been aged in wood. Wood aging tends to accelerate the development of colour. The nose has got these lovely characters, which are very typical Hunter Semillon. Lemon balm, talcum powder, waxy aromas, candle wax and beeswax, a touch of honey from the beeswax, 
fresh herbs, but clean, ripe herbs, not green herbs, but um, young, restrained, very fresh, doesn't have any toast in us yet. That's an interesting point. The, the Gibson is already starting to get a bit of toast. It's a year younger. This wine is a very slow aging wine. I think 15 is a very, is a classic hunter Semillon year, a better year for Semillon than for reds. And the wines are aging beautifully. Andrew Morgan thinks this is a 30 year wine. And we've certainly said, uh, drink it now until 2030, which by which time it will be 15 years old, but it's certainly going to live for a lot longer than that. <clears throat> Let's have finish tasting it before I start talking about the stats. Hmm. Sublime, absolutely sublime. Those who think that Semion from the Hunter is like battery acid, you better try this one. This is soft and fine and filigreed, beautiful line and length, crisp and clean on the finish. Great length to it, even though it's only about 11% alcohol, I think. <clears throat> Let me see. 11.5% alcohol. So this is a good, a good wine for dieters as well. Not too many calories, it's bone dry and low alcohol. Um, what can I say? I, I just, it's a wine I want to drink more of. I just, uh, you know, one sip is never enough. You need more. 95 out of hundred we scored it. So it's a good strong gold medal or gold ribbon. Um, it's uh, rated number two out of 43. Semillons from the lower hunter that we tasted from the 15 vintage. Two out of 43, that's a really high ranking. And we asked Andrew Morgan what he would serve with it. And being a bit of a restaurateur, he's uh, expanded his shoulders a bit and said, freshly shucked oysters with finger lime and cracked pepper. Well, I think simplicity is the key there. Oysters are fantastic with wine like this, even when Hunter Semillons are young, they go really well with oysters, especially if you squirt a bit of citrus onto the oyster. He's chosen finger lime, but you could use lemon, you could use um, ordinary green limes, cracked pepper. The only thing I would add to that is a bit of salt, a bit of rock salt, maybe. But um, if they're briny oysters, you don't need salt. A bit of really good quality bread, sourdough bread, and really good quality butter, and you, you've pretty well got a meal right there. Beautiful, beautiful wine. I really have trouble throwing that one out. Okay, moving on to the final wine of the night and the only red wine, token red wine. No, it's not a token red wine. It's a very good red wine and it's a Pinot Noir uh, because Pinot is really the ultimate summery red, I think. You can throw it in the fridge for an hour before you serve it if the weather's too warm, if the wine's too warm. It's not a wine that you need to be afraid, afraid to chill down a little bit. I've even been known to throw an ice block into one occasionally. Some people think that's heresy. There you go. Um, this wine, um, I'm going to use a different glass. This is the Plum 3 again, but it's their biggie. It's their red wine glass. Pinot Noir needs a glass that has a bit more volume of bowl so the, the bouquet can expand into it nicely. And you can, Pinot is a wine of perfume. So you don't want to cage that perfume up in some tight little prison of a glass. You want to let it expand. So a big glass with a nice wide bowl that you can really swirl it. Wow. And does that, that amplifies the aroma as well. So, you know, that's a really, that's a knockout, that bouquet. It's very hard to know which way to turn this bottle. That's the front label. It says absolutely nothing. That's the back label where all the information is. This wine is the Heirloom Vineyards Alcazar Castle. Alcazar Castle is the name of the vineyard. It's in the Adelaide Hills. It's a 2019 vintage. And these people, um, Zar and Elena Brooks, Elena or Elena, I'm not sure exactly how she would pronounce that, but way back in 2000, 20 years ago now, they established this, this business, Heirloom Vineyards. But they, they take grapes from several areas, the Barossa Valley, Eden Valley, Adelaide Hills, McLaren Vale, and Coonawarra. So they suit the source of the grapes to the style of wine and the variety of grape that they want. Probably take Cabernet from Coonawarra, Shiraz from Barossa, and so on, Eden Valley Riesling, etc., etc. Um, sensible way of making wine uh, without having to invest a lot of money in vineyards. 
Zara Brooks is one of the mercurial people of the wine industry. Uh, I run into him a lot at judging in wine shows. He is quite a, a talented and an unusual fellow. He's been involved in many different wine um, entities in South Australia. He started off at Wirra Wirra as a marketer, but he has been involved in, he's still involved in Zonti's Footstep, which a lot of people would know, and Dandelion Vineyards, which is probably the most, um, I don't know, they had the quite high expensive wines, Dandelion Vineyards. Some of them are uh, very, very good wines, top end wines. He, is, he and Elena are partners in both those businesses, but the main event now is this one, Heirloom Vineyards, which they own for themselves. They also produce some wine in Spain called Cien y Pico. Um, and Alcazar Castle, they make three different Pinots at Heirloom. And I think they're, I don't know which parts of the Adelaide Hills they're from, but this is the one that they think is their best Pinot vineyard because they approve the way the grapes are grown. They, they, the, 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 the clones that are used in this vineyard are the clones that they prefer. And as you'd be aware, there are many different clones available of Pinot Noir. Some of them are better than others. And uh, they suit, they need to be suited to the terroir they're grown on. What's grown in one vineyard in one region might not be the, the best in another region. They're hand tended vines and they're all sorted bunch by bunch. They're open fermented basket pressed and stored in first use French oak barrels from the top coopers. And it's $80 this wine. So it's, clearly the most expensive wine tonight. When I pick that up, well, the first thing is to note the colour. It's not particularly deep, but it is quite deep. I mean, Australian Pinots are never dark coloured, but that's good depth of colour and a good hue. It's still got a tinge of purple in the, in the rim. Um, it coats the glass. You can tell this is a wine with a bit of guts and a bit of substance. When you smell it, wow, there's a huge complexity of aromas there. I smell... Um, <laughs> The vegetal carries that come, characters that come with whole bunch ferment. There's some of that quite large on the nose. There is this, um, some people describe it as a Campari type character, which comes from whole bunch fermentation. There's licorice, there's cloves, there's uh, stewed cherries, perhaps sour cherries, some plummy aromas, a bit of spice, a bit of smokiness and spiciness, possibly from the barrels. All of these things come together in this wonderful amalgam on the nose. It's really quite delicious. And um, it makes me want to drink it. You know, it's, it's, it's the, the, the secret of a good bouquet. It makes you, it makes an irresistible wine. Mm. So intense flavor, medium, body more more on the full end of medium than, than than the middle if i can put it that way beautiful wine lasting flavor really has a long finish silky texture voluminous fills the mouth with flavor really a lot of amplitude in that wine that's a delicious wine indeed and um wow i think that wine is drinking at its best now but i would say in a year or two the oak might be even more resolved into the wine. The artifact characters, the oak and the stalks from a whole bunch might be even more resolved in a year or two and then drink it for another 10 years. No problem. Um, we rated that number, it got 94 points out of 100, so very high, so almost a gold. It got number four ranking of the 34 Pinot Noirs from the Adelaide Hills 2019 vintage that we tasted. So a very high ranking. And Eleanor, the winemaker has suggested duck with rhubarb beets and Asian greens. So duck is definitely a no brainer with Pinot Noir as far as I'm concerned. Rhubarb green beets, I'm not so sure what that means, but if you cook the rhubarb and cook the beetroot, um, both of those things would go really well with duck. There's something about the earthiness of beetroot that is, uh, there's an earthiness in Pinot Noir and the things go together beautifully well. So I think that's an excellent choice and a beautiful wine. So thank you for that, guys and girls. And we will take another question or two. We can just squeeze another one or two in before we have to close up. Um, Oscar says, can you put good glassware in the dishwasher? Absolutely, you can. You just have to place it correctly. If you let it flap around, it's going to break. But you need to secure it well and have a probably have a reasonable quality dishwasher as well. I'm not sure. 
um, and use a good quality detergent because there are some that will leave marks on your glassware. Um, what's the difference between Pinot? Joe says, what's the difference between Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio? Well, I know they're the same grape, but why are they two used, two names used? That's quite straightforward. You can read about that on the Real Review. We've written about it quite often. Uh, we've done posts on that. Pinot Grigio is an earlier harvested rendition of the same grape. Uh, they're usually lower in alcohol, higher in acidity, crisper, simpler wines. They're priced cheaper. They're not aged in wood. They don't have that exotic spice of a ripe Pinot Gris. Uh, alcohols are lower. Um, they're usually cheaper and they're modeled loosely on the Italian style because Grigio is the Italian word for gray, whereas Gris is the French word for gray. Pinot Gris is modeled on the Alsace French version of Pinot Gris or gray Pinot, which is usually picked riper and they often have exotic spice aromas. I had one the other day, which was absolutely magnificent, a 2018 from Josmeyer, a Grand Cru Hengst vineyard, fantastic wine. And the, the book A just blew me away. Um, spicy, light cheese, uh, more like, like a Gewürztraminer. It can get almost like a Gewürztraminer with, with ripeness. So that wine would have a touch of residual sugar, a much more ample book uh, flavor with a bit of uh, a bit more alcohol. And they go with very different styles of food. Unfortunately, the styles of Gris and Grigio can intersect quite a lot. And some people's Gris is more like a Grigio and vice versa. So there's a bit of confusion there. Um, I think we should probably finish up there because it's we're just over time. So thank you for your excellent questions and for paying attention to a whole hour of me talking about wine. I've enjoyed it, so I hope you have. Um, we should point you towards what's coming up next from The Real Review. We always say we'd love you to subscribe to Real Review if you don't already. We'd love to have you. Um, if you want the wines, go to the cellar door to door website and there's click throughs to all the wineries and you can buy them direct if you want. Next Thursday, we have, um, no, it's not the next Thursday, it's the 26th in two weeks' time, I think, is uh, Gold with Bob Campbell. I assume that means gold ribbon scoring wines. So that'll be mainly New Zealand wines, I suspect. Uh, Bob uh, is, is going to be on form and full of vim and vigour and talk about New Zealand. So do join him. And thank you again for tonight. See you next time.